At the beginning of October 1941, the German army assembled three panzer and two infantry armies, totaling 78 divisions and nearly two million men, to finally end the war that it had started four months earlier. German troops occupied a front line over 350 kilometers in length. Their objective was the capture of Moscow, the capital of the Soviet Union. To achieve this, the last available reserves were mobilized. The panzer divisions assigned to capture Leningrad were shifted south, while the continuation of the advance in Ukraine was left to Romanian formations. However, even after implementing these measures, there was little reason for optimism. In the first three months of the war against the Soviet Union, the German army of the East had lost more than half a million men. Every sixth German soldier had been killed or severely wounded. In addition to these unprecedented losses, only a third of the 3,600 tanks with which the army had gone to war were still operational, and even for these, fuel supplies near the front line were insufficient to sustain a prolonged offensive. Nevertheless, the German high command assumed that the outcome of the campaign in the east had been decided and that the Red Army had been defeated. Since the great battles of encirclement in the previous summer, more than 1.5 million Soviet soldiers had been taken into German captivity, at least 500,000 more had been killed, and 5,500 Russian tanks had been destroyed or captured. This would prove to be a false assumption, with far-reaching and dramatic consequences. Operation Typhoon commenced on the 30th of September 1941. The 6th Panzer Division, led by Panzer Regiment 11, launched its attack as part of General Hoth's 3rd Panzer Army, deeply penetrating the Russian lines north of Vyasma. Previously, the division had lost a large number of its tanks to technical breakdowns and enemy action. Panzer Regiment 11 was combined with Panzer Regiment 25 to form the temporary Panzer Brigade Kohl, which broke through the Russian lines north of Vyazma and crossed the Dnieper River a day later. However, the weather had turned, and continuous autumn rain transformed the roads into seas of thick, sticky mud, resulting in a near-total halt of movement. Operations came to a standstill, giving the Red Army the respite it needed to complete and consolidate its defensive positions and to replenish its forces. The 5th Company of Panzer Regiment 11 had lost 18 of its 24 tanks. The entire two battalion of the regiment had shrunk to the strength of a single weak company. Friedrich Sander, without tanks to lead, was transferred to a new temporary post as courier to the Eib, the second general staff officer and head of supply of the 6th Panzer Division, a position which offered ample opportunity to observe and ponder life behind the lines. The 6th Panzer Division had only 60 operational tanks of all types, and less than two weeks later, only 34 of its Panzer 35 T were operational, with 47 more requiring repairs or standing by to be scavenged for spares. When frost hardened the ground enough for operations to resume, the division's few remaining tanks rolled east in the hope of capturing Moscow before the onset of winter. In mid-November, German troops resumed their attack on what their propaganda called the capital of Jewish Bolshevism, with two panzer groups attacking the town of Klin, north of Moscow. In November 1941, Friedrich Sander was recalled to Panzer Regiment 11, rejoining his old company in Gzhatsk. The regiment, with its armoured strength severely depleted, had been pulled out of the line into a quiet area, awaiting transportation back to Germany for refit. The pace of the German advance had slowed considerably, hindered not only by the fierce resistance of the withdrawing Red Army troops, but also by the weather conditions. Temperatures had plummeted to minus 35 degrees Celsius, brutal even by Russian standards. The cold froze equipment, shut down diesel engines, and took a heavy toll on the German frontline soldiers, who, expecting a short campaign, had not been issued sufficient winter clothing. Serious logistical issues hampered the delivery of warm clothing and other winter equipment from the depots in Germany and Poland to the front lines. In heavy snowfall and freezing temperatures, the 6th Panzer Division, having captured the strategically important town of Rogachevo, was positioned about 30 kilometres from the Volga-Moscow Canal. In some areas, German troops were less than 20 kilometres from the outskirts of Moscow. 
The last operational tank of Panzer Regiment 11 had to be blown up after breaking down. Shortly thereafter, the last operational Panzer 35, T of the division, was also destroyed. For the first time since the outbreak of the war, the 6th Panzer Division found itself without a single working tank. The once powerful formation was now jokingly referred to as a Panzer Division on foot. From then on, the only available armoured strength consisted of vehicles that could be spontaneously made serviceable, patched up and repaired enough to be thrown into combat. December 1941 to September 1942. A motorcycle patrol of Panzer Pioneer Battalion 62 reached Kimki, a small river port in the northwest suburbs of Moscow, eight kilometres from the city and less than 20 kilometres from the Kremlin. Yet the ring around the city had still not been closed. The German panzer groups gradually ground to a halt. Since the beginning of November, Army Group Centre had lost nearly 46,000 men killed. The hopes of the men of Panzer Regiment 11 of soon reuniting with their families were dashed. Faced with a severe shortage of men, the regiment was ordered to form an infantry battalion to secure and defend the rearward lines, thus freeing regular infantry units for frontline service. This was a terrible blow for Zander, who suddenly found himself commanding a company of about 80 poorly equipped men. Using sturdy, captured Russian lorries, they were transported towards their defensive positions near Klin. The German army lacked winter quarters, there were no barracks, and the little available shelter often consisted of local villages with mostly small houses. With the lack of food and suitable winter clothing, casualties from hunger, epidemics and frostbite began to spiral out of control. Some regiments, once 3,000 men strong, had dwindled to fighting strengths of 500 men or less. The Wehrmacht's offensive had been halted, but German intelligence still erroneously estimated that Soviet forces were broken, without reserves, and that Stalin was unable to launch a counter-offensive. This estimate would prove catastrophically wrong. Unbeknownst to German intelligence, the supreme command of the Soviet armed forces had secretly assembled more than one million men, 780 tanks and 5,700 guns. While these numbers were not much greater than those of the German army along the entire Eastern Front, Stavka had concentrated troops in key areas to achieve local superiority. To break the German hold on Moscow, 34 Siberian divisions, expertly trained and equipped for winter warfare, were assembled. Those German units that the Red Army did not immediately overrun had no choice but to attempt a hasty retreat, which often failed. Smaller German formations were frequently outflanked, encircled and annihilated, not only in front of Moscow, but also in Ukraine, Crimea and at Leningrad. The force of the Russian offensive pushed the units of Army Group Center into a swift retreat. To hinder the rapidly advancing Red Army troops and to slow their progress, the retreating Germans resorted to scorched earth tactics. In some areas, entire villages were set ablaze and in some cases the local population was driven into the no-man's land between the opposing forces to impede the Soviet advance. In other places, inhabitants sympathetic to the German cause were allowed to evacuate themselves and their belongings to less important settlements. This strategy achieved its military objectives, but in the freezing temperatures, the loss of their homes was tantamount to a death sentence for many locals. For the first time, the violence and brutality against innocent people, including old men, women and children, began to disturb even a hardened individual like Friedrich Sander, whose writings during this period became increasingly dark and gloomy. German troops, realising that Moscow could not be captured in a final push, were not only physically but also mentally drained. Heavy equipment and fuelless vehicles were abandoned and destroyed. Many German soldiers completely lost faith in their military leadership, leading to the release of social Darwinist energies, resulting in increased violence and crime. Bothersome prisoners of war were often shot, civilians were plundered and expelled, and their livelihoods destroyed. Adolf Hitler issued his infamous Halt Order, strictly forbidding any further withdrawal unless approved by himself. This blanket solution, heavily based on ideological precepts, immensely hampered the flexibility of Army Group Centre to respond. 
It caused significant resentment among German commanders who thereafter had to find creative ways to oppose and outmaneuver the dangerous Halterbefehl, deliberately defying Hitler's assumption that the main requirement for holding a position was the iron will to do so. Sander and a small group of men under his command arrived in the temporary safety of Shakovskaya, after covering a distance of over 110 kilometres in a fighting retreat through ice and snow. On New Year's Eve, Sander and his men unexpectedly faced yet another attack by the Red Army, resulting in a further fighting withdrawal through harsh conditions. For the first time since the campaign began, Sander's diary fell silent, except for a few hastily scribbled words in his notebook. Weeks later, he briefly reflected on this period, when he and his men were helpless against an onslaught by heavy Russian tanks, listing the names of friends lost in battle, wounded comrades left behind in the snow, and how he and a few comrades barely managed to save their own lives. The great Russian counterattack, however, turned out to be, at best, a Pyrrhic victory. While it successfully pushed the German army further away from Moscow, the Red Army managed to recapture only 7% of the territory conquered by the Wehrmacht in the preceding months. Despite the high losses of Army Group Center, they paled in comparison to those suffered by the Red Army, which was losing over 500,000 men per month during this period, approximately six times more than the German invaders. Not a single German division had been completely destroyed. No major breakthrough had been achieved. Ultimately, the Soviet offensive lost momentum, positioning the German forces favourably for another major offensive planned for the following spring. From our deployment area, both regiments, 11 and 25, initially moved in the wrong direction, which led us too far north. However, the scene that unfolded before us was tremendous. Hundreds of tanks attacked and rolled across the open plain. Shells detonated around us, forcing us to duck and button up. As we rolled over the first line of enemy positions, already traversed by our infantry, we faced eager fire from wounded and solitary hiding Russians. The furthest Russian position consisted of well-constructed trench systems. We then approached a wide-open bush terrain, typical of Russia, and fanned out into a broad wedge formation. We stopped and waited to be marshalled to attack a hill to our northeast, marked by two leafless trees and a steep peak on the left side of the hill. Climbing back into our tanks, we waited for the order to attack, and then rolled forward. I was in the first wave with my platoon. Ores was on the left, and Oswald formed the reserve. Having lost Gror to a breakdown, who was now slowly catching up from the rear, I had only four tanks. As we traversed the first dense bushes, moving stubbornly forward without being able to spot the enemy, we were instructed to turn right, head towards the sun, Driving into the sun is always challenging, with squinting eyes and impaired vision ahead, not to mention the difficulty in seeing anything through the Czech optics if needing to fire. I pressed on through the dense bushes, indifferent to the apparent poor decision made by someone at the top in marshalling us in. Feldwebel Engelhardt was advancing on my left, Feldwebel Gobler on the right, and Unterofizier Albert next to him. Suddenly our vehicle was rocked by an enormous bang, so violent that my microphone, headphones and cap were blown off my head. For a moment I couldn't hear anything as clumps of earth rained down through the open turret hatch. The tank came to a halt. I initially thought we had been hit by artillery, but when I lifted my head out of the turret to see what had happened, I noticed a big hole in the ground under the track. Mines! I shouted to the radio operator, so he could warn the rest of the company before they all entered the minefield but it was already too late. A bang on our left side and one on the right, followed by another. The radio operator shouted back that the apparatus wasn't working. The enormous pressure had blown the receiver out of its socket. Screams and groans came from the left and right. The impact was greater there than on us. I dismounted and first ran over to Engelhardt. Otto Muller was being lowered into the grass. Trouthoff sat on the ground, groaning. Engelhardt himself was bleeding from the forehead, while only Enderman was unscathed. I began uncovering the mine system nearby, a skill we had learned at Leningrad. One can roughly estimate where the mines are buried. These damned green wooden boxes filled with what looked like small rolls of shaving soap. Suddenly the ground gave way under one of my feet. 
I was momentarily frozen in shock, my heart skipping a beat. Below the thin layer of grass, the green wood of a box mine became visible. But nothing happened. I hadn't broken the thin, sheer pin of the mine. The shock, however, shook me to the core. Otto Müller kept groaning, evidently in terrible pain. I began to assist the injured boy as best I could. Using my pocket knife, I cut the trousers from his body. Engelhardt helped, carefully pulling off one boot. The other was completely shredded. The kneecap of one leg was mostly gone, and thick blood oozed from a wound in the thigh of the other. We removed a few scraps of fabric from the wound before applying a tourniquet. His testicles were covered in blood. I asked him if he felt pain there. He didn't know. Upon examination, he seemed to have significant bruising, but otherwise everything appeared intact, thankfully. Trouthoff's calf was swelling considerably. It wasn't life-threatening, so we planned to check him later. First, we needed to assist Gobler, who was still in his vehicle. As we made our way there, I uncovered a few more mines to prevent further accidents. Beside the right track of my vehicle, another mine had been slightly depressed. My heart raced as I removed its grass cover. It had to be done. Stabsarzt Moschler was already tending to Gobler's vehicle. The mine had not exerted its force sideways as it had with ours, blowing off a track and a roller. Instead, it had smashed in the underside of the hull with the floor hatch, wreaking havoc inside. We managed to pull Gobler out alive, but both his legs were badly mangled. The surgeon and I applied tourniquets. His legs were barely attached to his body, held only by thin strips of sinew and flesh. Gobler was delirious with pain, singing in a slurred voice, unable to see us any more. His left eye had turned pallid and lost its colour, while the nerve of the right one appeared damaged by a splinter in his brow. With a knife and a pair of scissors, the doctor and I cut away the remains of his trousers to apply rubber tourniquets. The doctor wanted to move on and follow the regiment, instructing me to call for Oberarzt Menke and an armoured personnel carrier over the radio. Krautvig, the orderly officer, arrived with his vehicle, attempting to assist as best he could. All the tanks from Abteilung 65 and I. Abteilung passing by had no connection, or could only reach the company. I sent two of my men, Wilhelm Müller and Tutas, to the advance road to intercept and bring back a Sanka. Moschler didn't even have a stretcher with him. I dressed Gobler's head wound. Korter, who had an arm injury, was also with us. Using two wooden poles found at the edge of the minefield and a Russian tent square, I improvised a stretcher for Gobler. We gently placed him on it and carried him to a farm track where our tanks were passing by. His face was turning yellow, indicating he probably wouldn't survive. Next, I turned my attention to Oberholtz, he was still in the driver's seat of his tank, unable to move, and adamantly refused to be touched, insisting on staying in the tank. Nevertheless, two men carefully lifted him out. His spine was broken, and he was completely paralysed, barely able to speak. We placed a rolled-up coat under his head. His requests about the position of his head were distressing. Overwhelmed, I quickly checked on Vigand inside the tank. My nerves were at their limit. I wanted to scream, to release the tension. Nearby, Unteroffizier Albert discovered a cartridge box filled with explosives, buried as a mine. It was perilous, frustrating work, with the constant risk of triggering a mine. Müller and Tutas returned with stretchers. By then, Gobler's suffering had ended. He was dead. We covered his disfigured body with a Russian tent square and placed Otto Müller on a stretcher. His body shook uncontrollably, a symptom of blood loss. While dressing his wounds, I placed a small piece of wood between his teeth, instructing him to bite down if the pain became unbearable. However, he was too weak to even do that. Finally, we carried Trouthoff to the Sanka on a Russian stretcher. On the way, I stepped on another mine right beside Engelhardt's tank. After carrying all the wounded to the Sanka, which couldn't approach closer than 500 metres, we began to extract Vegan's body from the tank. The boy's suffering must have been brief. Life likely left his completely destroyed body instantly. Little Zimmerman placed a recovery belt around Wiegand's remains, but we struggled to pull him out as his feet were stuck. I had to use a pickaxe from the tank to free the mangled body. The battery had been pushed into his lower abdomen, 
a foot was wedged between wooden ammunition boxes. His body was torn open and flesh hung from his leg. The stench of warm blood mixed with battery acid. Everything I touched was slick with blood and his head was caved in. It made me reflect bitterly on the notion of a hero's death. This war was nothing but horrific. There was nothing beautiful or grand about it, just the hard, cold necessity, the damned duty and obligation, and the idea of a greater Reich and the security of our families at home. This is, of course, very different from the perspectives of those safe behind desks, away from whistling bullets and explosions. No sweeter death than to die in the face of the enemy. Is that really true? Suddenly, Vedder appeared, and Müller had repaired the radio, establishing a connection to Hiller. I informed Hiller that I would return with Vedder's tank. Paul got out and remained with my crew while I took command of Vedder's tank. After loading my things and changing the radio over, I followed the regiment. Saying farewell to my men was incredibly hard. I gave a last salute to the two fallen comrades, covered with tent squares at the roadside, and then I followed the regiment, humming the first stanza of the Panzerlied. In the evening, we caught up with the rest of the company. Most of them had already crossed the Kokosh. The sheer number of troops present was impressive. We traversed the Russian artillery positions. Just before reaching the Kokosh, Hauptmann Hagerman approached us. To my surprise, I saw Aris's tank. Feldwebel Aris is in the tank. He was shot in the head, Zervas shouted over. I quickly climbed onto the other tank to check on Aurus. He was kneeling inside the fighting compartment, his bleeding, bandaged head resting against a machine gun ammunition box, supported by one of the men. Aurus couldn't speak. His larynx had also been injured. We rolled through the outermost lines of the infantry and crossed the Kokosh via a ford. Soon I was back with my unit and took command of the third platoon, comprising crews from Frolich, Krohn and Hunica, totalling four tanks. Nearby stood a 15 centimetres gun with its towing tractor burned out. A few men were tampering with the breach, which earned them a stern reprimand from me. I recalled a similar situation in Tartusa, Lithuania, where an unattended, loaded Russian artillery piece had unexpectedly fired. The force of a barrel burst of that calibre is tremendous. An advancing group of infantrymen was suddenly fired upon from some foxholes near the street, less than 20 metres from us. After we threw a hand grenade into one of the holes, five soldiers emerged. One, with a foot torn off by the grenade, was shot dead by the infantry. Our panzer crew wanted to shoot the remaining Russians too, but I managed to stop them. At that moment, a squadron of Stukas flew over and dived down just ahead of us. Our troops fired white signal flares and ignited yellow smoke charges, but one pilot still dropped his bombs. Our infantry, mistaking them for Russians, opened fire on the Stukas. As they disappeared, Russian Curtis planes appeared. I was sitting in the turret writing in my diary when explosive rounds detonated on and among our vehicles, creating chaos. During the night, our advance continued down a wide new road. At Baikawa, we set up an all-round defence, while ahead, the sky was lit by four burning villages under artillery assault. A bit further away, an ammunition dump exploded. The attack is in motion. Should our sister regiment encounter no resistance in the nearby forests, we will push past Cholm towards the Dnieper. If they do meet resistance, we'll move into the forest on the left, our Abteilung is advancing now. I spent the night sleeping in the tank and feel quite refreshed, despite my nerves being completely frazzled. It was incredibly difficult to transition into Veda's tank and continue moving forward. Hiller's praise seems insignificant now. Apart from the boss, the only other company officer left is Willem Lope, and he commands a Panzer IV. It was my duty and obligation to lead at the front, I have to set aside my nerve issues, unlike Zangenmeister, Neuling, Baum, Dermin and others. I can't dwell on this anymore. Even the staff surgeon, decorated with his EK-1, turned pale and lost his professional demeanour upon seeing the shredded bodies. Oberholtz, unable to move with his broken back, and Otto Müller, lying there moaning and groaning, asking for a Sanka, haunt my thoughts. I hope Oberholtz doesn't suffer further injuries during transport. His nerves were shattered too, constantly asking me to reposition his head. 
the thought of poor little Wiegand brings tears to my eyes again. In such moments, all one can do is take a deep breath and maintain composure. After this experience, I would consider becoming a doctor after the war if I weren't too old. While treating the wounded yesterday, I remained calm. But later, seeing the sad remains of my platoon and the wounded, I couldn't help but break into tears. The war is incredibly hard. We are moving now. I've just written a few lines to my parents, assuring them that I'm still well and healthy. Will I cross the Dnieper today? As we drove south, it dawned on us that we were forming the focal point of the attack, indicated by the fact that the light from the burning villages was now far behind our leading tanks. The roads were in terrible condition. Roland is my driver, Brune operates the radio, and Muller 2Y is my gunner. On our way here, we rolled over a Russian ammunition supply column. Now the draft horses are grazing at the roadside. A group of Stukas, returning from a bombing raid, flew low over the treetops. We waved at them as we continued, crossing open terrain past Danilova and other villages en route to the Dnieper. Behind Pustoshka, the Russians had dug an anti-tank trench alongside a stream, similar to the defences at Cholm. Abteilung 65 crossed this trench near Romaniki and Veselova, but soon encountered enemy tanks, previously reported by our flyers. Despite this, the lead element lost four Skodas and a Panzer IV to the Russians, and had to withdraw hastily when Russian infantry tried to cut off their retreat towards the bridgehead. My platoon and Lopez Panzer IV were then deployed to keep the Russian infantry in the trench at bay. Oswald's platoon covered our flank. We were successful, and the enemy in the trench retreated towards their main position at Cholm. By evening, my platoon was down to three tanks as oofs. Kolner's vehicle had broken down again. We spent the night sleeping beneath our tanks to avoid the ongoing fire of Russian mortars and artillery. At 9.15pm, we were roused by a false alarm. A nervous unteroffizier had mistaken a Russian shepherd and his herd for enemy infantry. He had seen movement, and instead of responding when challenged, the shepherd had thrown himself to the ground. All tanks were ready by 5.30am. However, the rest of the Abteilung wasn't, and a bridge was still being constructed. After sunrise, we advanced with the 7th Abteilung, led by Feldwebel Ulrich. The sun had just risen, making it difficult for us to see anything clearly. From the south, we bypassed the village of Romaniki and then squeezed past it, beginning to cross the small stream from which the Russian tanks had attacked the day before. As we did so, we were met with a raging defensive fire. I returned fire using my machine gun. It was a dire situation, standing on open ground, struggling to see against the glare of the rising sun and watching as the two tanks beside mine were destroyed. Additionally, the steering of my own Skoda Supersport wasn't functioning properly. I was fortunate to get through this. Froelich's vehicle suffered an engine breakdown somewhere. Hiller was in H-31, operated by Unteroffizier Hagemann. The 7th Company's lead then engaged Russian tanks. Feldwebel Ulrich was only two metres away from a Christie tank, which fired around directly into the machine gun of the Skoda's loader, killing him. Another Christie approached from the right, was hit by one of our tanks, and burst into flames. Then Ulrich used his gun to eliminate the Russian tank at an incredibly close range. 300 metres away, I spotted another Russian tank firing at us. But how could I hit it with my poor Czech optics, especially aiming against the sun? Without tracer ammunition and unable to observe the fall of our shots when firing unaided, I ceased firing at this target. What followed was utter chaos. There were no orders from the Abteilung, only requests from the company. Oswald was issuing orders to his platoon, but then forgot to switch off the transmitter. One by one, our tanks were destroyed. In front of me, Feldwebel Ulrich and his crew were scrambling between the tanks. His wild hair hung in his face, and his blue neckerchief dangled from his jacket. Hyuk, his driver, was with him. I won't soon forget the expressions on their faces. Oberleutnant Hiller and his tank were right behind me. Tank shells repeatedly slammed into the dirt around us. With no orders coming from the Abteilung, Hiller inquired about our next move. Hauptmann Stern bluntly replied, The fifth is to break through. And Hiller relayed the order to the company. 
Oberfeldwebel Oswald realized the absurdity of the order and simply ignored it, while I continued to comb the edge of the forest with machine gun fire. I instructed Roland, the driver, to fire up the engine. Often the crew inside a vehicle doesn't realize the peril they are in, which can be good. But I decided to inform them that this was a do-or-die situation and that we would need a lot of luck to avoid being destroyed. The many burning tanks surrounding us didn't boost my confidence. The engine struggled to pull and the left steering was malfunctioning. I drove toward Leonhardt's Panzer IV, which was positioned behind a bush, and then headed straight across the boggy ground. The old vehicle churned through the mud at a painfully slow pace. Half a kilometre away, in the shade of the forest's edge, I spotted a Russian tank firing into the mass of our vehicles. I fired one ineffective shot at it, but with less than a 1% chance of hitting, it was better to ignore such a prominent target and conserve ammunition. However, instead of advancing as ordered, the other vehicles began to withdraw slowly. I found myself completely alone at the front, near a narrow road, as some hidden Russians unleashed a barrage of machine gun fire at my turret. Using my machine gun, I managed to silence them momentarily. They had riddled all the full fuel cans, tent squares, and rolled up coats and blankets on the rear of my tank, but it seemed that the Russians had either withdrawn or ducked back into their foxholes. At that moment, I watched my surroundings like a hawk, not wanting to encounter any hand grenades or Molotov cocktails in my exposed position. Wilhelm Lope had realised my predicament, and along with his loader, fired their machine guns into the bushes beside me. Looking to the rear, I saw at least three burning tanks. Another tank was ablaze in the bushes next to me, its black smoke drifting across the street. It's not a pleasant feeling being in such a situation. But then Hiller called, ordering us to retreat from the unseen enemy. The dilemma was how to do that with the problematic vehicle I and my three men were in, especially when the route was so treacherous that the other tanks couldn't even cross it going forward. I was furious. Nonetheless, an order is an order. Now it was up to the driver, and especially me, to navigate the vehicle back as best as possible. Between us and the bush where Leonhardt's Panzer IV was stationed lay a large open plain, with fire raging from both sides. The 4.7 centimetres guns of the Russians were perforating our tanks as if they were made of paper. I had Roland climb up into the turret to scout the route over the perilous terrain. We had to avoid a large waterhole. If we got stuck in it, no one could pull us out. So we started reversing until we reached the bush where Leonhardt had positioned his Panzer IV. We had made it, and I can't express how relieved I was. The events that followed are hard to put into words. As soon as the Panzer IV moved, we made another dash towards the rear. During this manoeuvre, an unseen enemy fired a few shots at us from the left flank. The situation was becoming dire, and the old Skoda struggled to move through the mud. It was frustrating. There we were, exposed, waiting for the shell that fate had in store for us. One of the tanks beside us was hit by the unknown assailant. At that moment, Breed called out to us to take some of the wounded with us to the rear. The doctor, who had been wounded in the arm by a shell splinter, was running around. I climbed out of the tank. Unterofizier Moller lay on the ground, one leg missing and the other severely injured. The doctor had already applied rubber tourniquets. It was a sight I knew too well. Moller's face had turned yellow, a sign he wouldn't survive the transport. Oofs! Walter Bethke was also there, luckier, with only one leg full of splinters only in relative terms. With Zimmerman, Dreyer's driver, assisting, I placed Moller on the engine deck of our tank. Bethke, still able to move, climbed up by himself. However, the staff surgeon had already jumped back into his panzer too, attempting to escape. His departure infuriated me. Where the hell are you going? I demanded, but he just pointed hectically towards the rear and sped off. He had just disappeared when Oberfeldwebel Busser, Jupp Wellinghoff, my classmate from Caroly Gymnasium, and a small gefreiter named Thieschwis leaped out of their Panzer IV and into a rainwater ditch at the field's edge. At that instant, their Panzer IV took several direct hits before bursting into flames. The Russians then redirected their fire towards us, likely from a 7.62 centimetres gun, launching shot after shot into the field. 
Jupp had two severely burned hands and a scorched face. I could see raw flesh where skin hung in strips from his hands. His left foot had been torn open by a grazing shot, the entire boot shredded. The little gefreiter was also wounded. My tank, the last operational one, was moving. I instructed Brun to fetch an armoured half-track for the wounded. Brun left us with his machine pistol, jogging off after our tank. I later learned that after catching up with the tank, my crew headed back to Bolshansk. On their way, they were hit by a Russian anti-tank gun, which caused no significant damage but holed a few petrol cans on the back of the vehicle. Fortunately, Bethke was not further injured. Upon arrival, Brun ensured that Bethke was taken to the hospital and then approached Hauptmann Stern, requesting that he send a few tanks back to assist us. However, this request was denied. Undeterred, Brun decided to return to help us himself. While doing so, he was spotted by Hauptmann Bergstahler and immediately sent back to the village. It was a stroke of bad luck. Meanwhile, in the field now strewn with our burning tanks, I administered first aid to the little gefreiter. I removed a few scraps of fabric from the wound in his hip before applying a dressing. With no more dressings available, I used a piece of string to apply a tourniquet to Jupp Wellinghoff's heavily bleeding wound. Oberfeldwebel Bunzer was also moaning, complaining of a foot injury. Upon closer inspection, I found only a minor flesh wound and reprimanded him for making such a fuss over it. To distract him, I handed him the machine pistol and instructed him to watch for any approaching Russian infantry. Just then, the Panzer IV exploded, showering us with a rain of metal fragments. Since the 7.62 gun was still firing, I decided that the three of us needed to leave on foot. Jupp, despite his severely injured foot, managed to walk. I was astonished to find that little Thieshuis, despite a deep wound in his hip, was still quite mobile. I forgot to mention that earlier, Obergefreiter Tiemeyer from Hereford, also a member of Bunce's Panzer IV crew, and Obergefreiter Grothuis of the Seventh Company had passed us. In the midst of the wild chaos, I had sent the two of them, along with Zimmermann, towards the rear. Taking Jupp Wellinghoff under my arm, we hobbled together towards Bolshansk. We hadn't gone far when suddenly we came under machine gun fire from the left and from the forest on our right. We threw ourselves to the ground and continued crawling forward. I was amazed at Jupp's endurance, especially considering his badly burned hands, which were now shedding bloody water, not to mention his severely wounded foot. Bunzer and the little gefreiter also kept pace with us. We kept crawling, and each time anyone raised their head, bullets whistled over us. Eventually, we reached a position about 400 metres in front of Bolshansk, which was still ablaze and smoking. Then, about 300 metres to our left, I spotted several figures wearing steel helmets, but our men didn't wear such large greatcoats. Using Bunce's binoculars, I confirmed they were Russians. A terrible sinking feeling hit my chest and stomach as I realised we were cut off from our regiment, surrounded. What a predicament! So what should we do? Considering our dire situation, we four decided to stay low and wait. I scanned the surroundings with the binoculars. The Russians were spread out in a line, blocking our route, especially to the right. The Russian artillery was firing into an area even further to the right, indicating that it was still our territory. On the road behind us, where we had recently been, several columns of Russian infantry were now marching. Russian tanks were advancing towards the forest in front of Cholm, while others, with turrets turned to the rear, were rolling towards Romaniki. We could also see the Russian tank that had fired at us earlier. It was a dire situation. We were cut off on both sides. Our only hope was that the Russian positions, which my platoon and Lopez Panzer IV had fired upon yesterday, remained unoccupied. But first, I intended to crawl back towards a burned-out Skoda tank on the right side of the road. Perhaps the wounded could take shelter beneath it. The thought of surrendering crossed my mind. As an officer, my chances of surviving a surrender were slim, but the others might escape unharmed. I knew Jupp Wellinghoff's wife in Osnabrück, and that weighed on my mind. Yet I resolved not to surrender to the Russians as long as I had bullets in my pistol. While crawling towards the Skoda, I saw Gruthuis from the 7th Company running back. He stood behind the burned-out tank, followed by Zimmermann. 
Both still had their pistols, ready to defend themselves. Gruthuis's face was blackened and scorched. I approached them and then instructed them to return. Jupp, who was behind me, asked what he should do. I urged him to muster his strength once more and join the others, who were now retreating along a row of bushes. On the field ahead, I spotted a group of Russian infantry examining the bodies of some fallen German soldiers. It was time to act. I shouted over to Bunser to provide fire support. Zimmermann, Grutuis, Jupp and Tieschuis had reached a shallow ditch 200 metres behind us and were preparing to head towards the forest in front of Cholm. Why were they going there? I had instructed them to move towards the area on the right, where Russian artillery was shelling. This move caught the attention of a group of Russians who immediately opened fire on us, escalating the danger for me. The Russians in front took cover behind the burned-out tank and started firing at Bunce and me, while Bunce returned fire with his machine pistol. I crawled back towards the bushes and covered Bunce when he jumped back to join me. Bunce had emptied his first magazine. We were being fired upon from the left as well. We needed to retreat quickly. Bunce's machine pistol jammed. The magazine was stuck. The Russians were now only 50 metres away. They were throwing hand grenades. I could see the green fragmentation rings of their stick grenades arcing through the air, landing about five metres short, thankfully. Bunzer had moved further back and I had to follow. Crawling on my stomach through the shallow ditch, I aimed for the bushes fifty metres away. At this point, I was beyond caring. I had run just ten metres when the Russians unleashed a furious barrage of fire. I felt like a sitting duck. I threw myself into the grass and dragged my exhausted body forward, struggling to breathe. Then suddenly, I felt a hard blow to my head from behind. Removing my cap, I touched my skull, which throbbed painfully. There was no blood, but my cap had a hole where a bullet had passed through. My vision flickered red, but I gathered my strength to continue. Once I reached the bushes, I hurried as fast as I could to another ditch in the field. The Russians on the right were alarmingly close. Nearing the ditch ahead, I spotted a few men dressed in black. Thankfully, they were our men, already far ahead. But in that moment, I had to focus on my own safety. I started running across the rye field as quickly as possible. The soil clung to my boots, making each step heavier. But that didn't matter. What followed was the most intense and terrifying 1,000 metres sprint of my life. Behind me, the Russians were screaming and shouting. When they shot at me, they had to pause, giving me a chance to put more distance between us. 300 metres to go. I raced across the field with long strides. When I couldn't breathe any more, I threw myself to the ground for just a moment before continuing. I held the pistol in my right hand, binoculars in my left. At that point, I was beyond concern for my safety. Bullets smacked into the ground around me and whizzed past my head. Regardless, I had to keep moving. I reached a hollow and threw myself down again, just deep enough to shed my coat. I took the spare magazines from the pockets, crammed the maps, calendar, notebook and diary into my trouser pockets, and then continued running in my grey turtleneck pullover. I was tempted to mount one of the horses running around in the field, but without knowing how to handle them, I decided to rely on my own legs. I walked the next 100 to 200 metres to conserve my stamina. The Russians hadn't kept up with me, but as I walked through a sunflower field, the volume of fire from the left increased again. Dismissing the danger, I focused on conserving my strength. In front of me, I saw the position I had fired upon just the day before. Staring into the trees, I couldn't see a single Russian. The positions had been abandoned. I jumped over a trench and approached a small stream running along the valley floor. With a few big steps, I crossed the water, another 100 metres, and I climbed over a fence to disappear among the trees. The Russians sent a few machine gun volleys in my direction, but now I was safe. I moved deeper into the undergrowth, taking extra care to avoid any Russian reconnaissance squads. Inside the undergrowth, I felt secure and protected. The skills I had honed playing cowboys and Indians in the forests of my hometown and during my time in the Boy Scouts were now proving useful. I was quite proud of moving silently from bush to bush. Thoughts of home crossed my mind, and I wondered if my father had ever faced situations like this. After the war, I resolved to marry. 
Having a son at home, even if just a toddler, would bring me much comfort. I also reminisced about my army days in Freistadt, particularly the lack of physical exercise among the officers. None of the officers in the Abteilung could have matched my pace today. Soon I reached a small valley with a stream running through it, adjacent to a pasture. The peacefulness contrasted sharply with the recent chaos. On the other side were colourful leaves of birch and nut trees, interspersed with pines. It felt like a serene autumn stroll, and suddenly tears filled my eyes without knowing why. Reflecting on the incredible luck I had experienced in the past days, I couldn't help but join my hands in gratitude, looking up through the treetops into the bright blue sky. I found myself praying, not in a traditional Christian sense, but rather in a personal reflection. Wilhelm Lope once told me that everyone here must be at peace with themselves, consider their lives already completed, and never rely on help from any side. Man is not grand enough to hope for the assistance and help of a higher being. Our daily experiences here demonstrate how small and insignificant our lives are, and how we must be grateful simply for existing. This realisation compels us to strive for greatness, as only through significant achievements can we justify our existence. I have come to understand the triviality of the threat of death in moments as serious as these. Death had become inconsequential to me. I didn't care about it anymore. I removed my cap, examining the long tear left by the bullet. A few millimetres lower and my name would have joined the list of the 17 officers killed during the campaign in Russia, including the Prince of Ratibor in Poland and Schlegel in France. It's a stark reminder of how insignificant we are and how little is lost with our passing. At that moment, I touched my lucky charm medallion, my talisman. Looking at it now, it imbued me with a sense of strength and warmth. Everything within and around me had been profoundly affected. I was eager to return home. Emerging from the forest, I checked for any tanks in the village of Pastoshka. If they were gone, my next step would be to find Kampfgruppe Raus beyond the forest. From the edge of the forest I could see the rooftops of Pastoshka and also the Russians at Bolshansk. I had to keep moving. I retreated into the undergrowth, as the forest edge was too dangerous. Then suddenly a lorry, a license-built Ford, appeared before me. It was parked inside the forest, its engine running. I approached it cautiously. Its crew had to be nearby. However, there was no one in sight. Were there weapons inside? On the load bed, I found a parachute and a leather flying cap, both German. The pilot's chances seemed grim if he had fallen into the hands of the Reds. In the lorry, there was a box with sausages and another with cutlery. I took five small sausages as potential rations for a longer journey, along with the flying cap as a souvenir. The white silk of the parachute was also tempting. It would make a nice wedding dress and could be used to signal when encountering German troops. Our riflemen tend to shoot at anything that moves. Deciding against taking the silk, I climbed up a tree to survey the surroundings. Tanks were advancing up the road towards Cholm, and Russian infantry was present too. After walking for another thirty minutes, I stepped out of the forest again. Now I had a clear view of Pastoshka. There were tanks and men walking and standing among the trees. They were ours. Elated, I ran into the field, waving frantically to avoid being mistakenly shot. Suddenly I noticed a Russian soldier lying in the field. Had they surrounded the village? But then I saw tank tracks and realised these were the corpses of Russians mown down by Vasmuth. Our men were now approaching me, expressing disbelief and joy at my return. I received backpats and congratulations, shaking many hands. Officers, including Lope and Theo Langenbruch, came to see me, each sharing their amazement. They had already given up on me. Willem Lope's nerves were visibly frayed. He was on the verge of tears. I attempted to lighten the mood with a joke to make him laugh, but even I couldn't entirely mask the bitter seriousness in my voice. I half-jokingly asked him if he truly thought I would leave him alone in this group of cyclists and no-hopers. Fortunately, everything had turned out well. Roland and Brun, my loyal comrades, along with Muller and the old friends from the Signals platoon, all came over to offer kind words. Feldwebel Ulrich and his driver were there too. I recounted the entire story to Major Lowe, 
and didn't shy away from criticising the lack of tanks sent back to support us. My displeasure with the whole disastrous attack was evident. He tried to rationalise the situation, explaining to me and his other subordinates, who now seemed like his judges, that we had engaged the 101st Red Armoured Division at Bolshansk, thereby keeping the path to the Dnieper bridgeheads open for our troops. In response, I could only sarcastically congratulate him on his prestigious success, given my status compared to that of a Knight's Cross holder like him. Afterward, Willem Lope and I went to a well to wash up, followed by a bit of food. As we watched the Russians use their Christie tanks to tow away their damaged tanks and our wrecked Skodas, including the command tanks of the 5th and 7th companies with their valuable radio documents, I decided to visit the wounded.